So I'm going to spend the next 50 to 60 minutes um, showing you just how tough we make it for fundraisers at Amnesty International and what we fundraisers are trying to do about it. So this is the story of how Amnesty International is learning to love fundraising and even fundraisers. And I should have plenty of time at the end for your questions, if you can hold on to them until then. But let me start by introducing myself just a little bit, although John's done uh, much of that job for me. So my name is Alison Wallace, and I am the Director of International Fundraising at the International Secretariat of Amnesty International, based in London. I've been in my role for a little over six years, and I love my job. I'm almost a lifelong, since 18 years old, member and supporter of Amnesty International and active in my local group. But some days, Amnesty International sure is a hard organisation to love. And this is why. This is Amnesty International's integrated strategic plan for the period 2010 to 2016. Can anyone see the fundraising related goal in that plan? Not really. <laughs> Just, it, it doesn't even help if you can see it more closely, believe me. Well, it's in the bottom row, <laughs> in the dark purple, in the line headed resources. Yep, it's at the end of the plan and it's all about money. Later, on page 21 of the 22 narrative that goes with this plan, we're given a little more information about what increasing our donors and growing our resources, that's the goal that's in there at the bottom, actually means. I won't read you what is written there, but suffice it to say there isn't a smart objective in sight. And to make matters worse, Every mention of the word market is put in inverted commas. So Amnesty International will invest in new markets and new tools, for example. So what's going on here if this is the way in which fundraising is represented in Amnesty International's integrated strategic plan? Is Amnesty International merely suffering from a case of poor strategy writing? Well, we certainly wouldn't be the first organisation in our sector to suffer from that. And a lot of organisations suffer from no strategy writing at all. There are some other symptoms to look at before we reach a diagnosis. Symptoms other than just how the integrated strategic plan looks. And here's one of them. Up until relatively recently, this was a fair selection of Amnesty International logos from around the world. The iconic Amnesty International candle didn't even make it into a couple of them. But hey, at least we all more or less agreed on the name. <laughs> In a couple of places were only Amnesty. And this was a fairly representative selection of our communications materials. Again, the candle sometimes doesn't even make it onto these. It's very hard to tell from that both who we are and what it is we're about. So you can see we have some real issues with our global identity. And our confusion in print follows us online. Here are some screenshots of website homepages from three English-speaking Amnesty International offices. Indeed, the digital space has really only opened up the opportunity for Amnesty International's multiple personalities. I checked in with our head of digital communications yesterday. He told me we have 150 websites around the world which is tough given we only have 70 actual offices, of which probably only 40 could actually afford to set up their own website. So there's quite a lot of proliferation out there. 
So I followed up his answer to my question with, okay, so how many apps and Facebook pages and YouTube materials and all the rest of it do we have? And he said, I have no idea. Lots. So we have some real, real challenges with how we are presenting ourselves out there to the world. Oh, and it starts to get more tricky still. We also have real problems with the content of those communications. Amnesty International in the UK ran a very powerful and compelling direct mail cash appeal centered on the appalling issue of stoning in Iran. They did this late last year. And that's a, a, a copy there of the leaflet that went in the mail pack. Very compelling, very moving. Tens of thousands of people in the UK read the mail pack and hundreds responded. It's an appalling issue. It's incredibly difficult to even get your mind around the idea that this still occurs in some parts of the world. The only problem was that Amnesty International's global priority statement, briefly reproduced there on the right, uh, the movement had agreed prioritising for campaigning over a two-year period that didn't, in fact, focus on the issue of cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment in national justice systems or even violence against women. Rather, it focused on three issues highlighted here, campaigning for an arms trade treaty, supporting and embedding change in the Middle East, and acting against forced evictions. That meant that there was very little to follow up the success of the UK's appeal with. Very little material existed to develop supporter engagement around the broader issues of violence against women and cruel, inhuman and degrading punishment, and encourage further support for Amnesty International. That appeal, in a sense, went out on a bit of a communications limb. And this is not a one-off thing at Amnesty International. We had the same challenge with a direct mail appeal issued by Amnesty International in Spain. A direct mail appeal focusing on the issue of child soldiers, how they're reintegrated into their societies and communities in the aftermath of prolonged civil war and violence. Again, not captured there in one of Amnesty's three strategic priorities for the two-year period. And again, little material on which to follow up with donors and supporters if they were interested. So between all of those things, our logos, our publications, our online presence, and some of the content of what we are saying, you can see Amnesty International has some real internal confusion, if not competition, in fact, around image, identity, and content. And this internal competition is against a backdrop of, backdrop, sorry, of a significant external competition itself spurred on by the economic crisis, growing need, and new media opportunities. The last five years in particular have seen dr dramatic developments in online, high profile, popular, and successful campaigning, right, frankly, in Amnesty International's backyard. Avaaz, for example, will be familiar to most of you. Some of you have possibly even taken action, and I shall forgive you because you couldn't choose which of Amnesty's 150 websites you wanted to go to, so you went to Avaaz. Launched only five years ago, not even. Grow into 14 million members in 194 countries. As a comparison, Amnesty International likes to lay claim to 3.2 million members and supporters, so they've done a little bit of extra work somewhere along the line. They're estimating over 83 million actions taken, and they have actually secured 12, 20 million US dollars in funding over that time. They operate in 15 languages and with 50 staff. That's an incredible operation to have set up and got active in around five years. Many of you, many of you will be one of the 91 million people who viewed this on YouTube. So the organisation itself actually, that produced this actually founded in 2004, and this was released in March of this year, 2012, the Joseph Coney video. I urge you to go and have a look at it. I mean, Amnesty International has concerns about some of the claims they make, some of the ways in which they've gone about 
uh, uh, publicizing the issue, but you should go and have a look at it. It's a fantastic piece of compelling and motivating filmmaking. Uh, a poll in America suggested that half of young adults had heard about Joseph Coney in the days following the video's release. I bet most people hadn't even heard of the Democratic Republic of Congo or any of those countries up to that point, let alone that Coney was a wanted war criminal. So, and, over, and interestingly, over a quarter of the 16 of the 91 million views actually came from a mobile device. Very interesting that people are not waiting until they get home in front of their laptops or their PCs. They're looking at this on the move, which probably explains how 91 million people can see it so quickly. Finally, change.org, perhaps a little less well known, but it uses online petitions to promote social change. But again, uh, set up at much the same time as Avaaz, and by April this year, it had hit 10 million members, and it's the fastest growing social action platform on the web. And they receive 500 new petitions a day and 100 employees across four continents. That, again, is a significant operation to have set up in that kind of time frame. So this is astonishing growth rates in these organizations. And even if you could argue with how the weight of numbers translates into actual change, and believe me, Amnesty International does, you cannot argue with the many millions of people who have become engaged with these issues. And we know that this kind of volume engagement in fundraising and marketing drives our growth. The more people we're talking to, the more people we have the opportunity of bringing on board with our cause. If only a small proportion of these many millions convert to other forms of action, indeed if it was only the one or two percent many of us get in our cold mail appeals, and we could convert them to other forms of support, we could, then we could create real impact. And we know that engaging with people and generating that volume is incredibly important, and indeed we do at Amnesty International as well. We have been one of the leading users of face-to-face -face fundraising, for example, over the last 10 years. And of course, it's not just online that we face competition, although that's where the greatest changes have come. Amnesty International's traditional competition other INGOs who do the same kinds of marketing communications are all out there too. UNICEF, Greenpeace, Save the Children, I dare say there might be some of those colleagues here today as well. We can see that compared to some of these other organizations, Amnesty International's growth rates have slowed in the last few years both absolutely and relatively. Unfortunately, Amnesty is pretty much at zero over the last couple of years, which is why we don't really show right here on the right-hand end. And yet, Amnesty International should be very well placed to weather the current economic storms. We have great brand identity, if it's confused. How many other film clips could we put together about World Vision or Greenpeace or UNICEF, for example? We have geographical and market diversity, and we have a great proposition, freedom. But you can see here the implications of this internal and external competition. So I think now we should have a pretty good sense of the diagnosis. Amnesty International Sure has a good overall intention, increase our donors and grow our resources. That's what was captured in the integrated strategic plan in my first slide. But we're not well geared up to realize that intention. Too many things are getting in the way of our growth. And too many of those things are actually inside Amnesty International, let alone outside Amnesty International. Amnesty International has not been in love with its fundraisers. So, what is the treatment? Well, before I can answer that, I'm going to have to give you a crash course in Amnesty International's international structures. 
So I hope you all had at least one shot of espresso before I get on to this one. Mm. So the groans in the audience <laughs> suggested this is not the most straightforward of diagrams. Amnesty International is a membership-based organisation. Not only are our 3.2 million members a key source of the financial and campaigning support that makes Amnesty International so great, they also participate in the governance of the organisation. And they do this in two ways. Firstly, every two years at the International Council meeting, they decide on key elements of strategy, elect the International Executive Committee and, and, uh, from the international membership. And that International Executive Committee, you can see in the middle towards the top, is essentially the International Secretariat's board. Secondly, our members elect national boards from the national membership in each of our sections and structures. That's our jargon for our national chapters. And as I said before, we have around 70 of those national chapters. That means that each of our sections and structures is independently governed and managed. Each section drafts, agrees and implements its own strategic plan. Each section drafts and agrees its own fundraising strategy and sets its own fundraising forecast. So now some of what we saw earlier begins to make a little more sense. Even with an integrated strategic plan, and a global priority statement, national, national sections determine their own goals and priorities. So now different logos, different branding, different appeal content all start to make a little more sense. And it starts to be a little bit clearer about how tough a job I have. This governance structure gives you an idea about my role. I'm in there in the International Secretariat box at the bottom in the middle. I report to the Secretary General and I am accountable to the International Executive Committee. My relationship with our national sections is represented through that very ambiguous horizontal arrow in the bottom left. To cut a long story short, I have no direct authority over the fundraising teams in those national sections and neither does my boss. Although we both like to think differently from time to time, but that's a whole other story. We also have very limited financial information coming into the International Secretariat. It principally takes the form of statements of income from which contributions to the Secretariat are calculated. They're like tax returns. No fundraising or marketing information comes to us. No member or supporter information comes to us. So what does the Director of International Fundraising do to increase donors and grow resources, as we saw in the plan at the beginning? Well, after just two years in my job and networking within Amnesty International like it was going out of fashion, something very, very helpful happened. Hillary Clinton was supposed to have said never miss the opportunity of a good crisis. She and I don't actually know each other personally, by the way, in case I don't want to misrepresent anything, I just added that in. Although I think she'd be a very interesting person to know. In 2008, the global economic crisis hit. Back then it was known as a credit crunch. Now, of course, it's known as a Eurozone crisis. The senior leadership and governance of Amnesty International had an urgent need to know how this might affect Amnesty's hitherto stable and predictable income streams. Those two years I had spent networking like it was going out of fashion and trying to find out who was doing what and how well it was working suddenly became incredibly helpful. Within 24 hours, I had been able to speak to the 12 or so directors of fundraising who raised around 90% of Amnesty's income and hear from them about what they thought was happening, what they thought the risks were, and what they thought might happen in the future. Just in that series of phone calls and exchanging information between those people, I was able to establish a sense of shared purpose and a shared role 
in trying to maintain Amnesty International's income. And there was more than just this opportunity to be seized. In the weeks prior to the global economic crisis at the end of 2008, the International Secretary had, Secretariat had also launched an organisational audit process using external consultants Accenture. Now the aim of that review, entirely independent of what we were trying to do in fundraising, was to understand how Amnesty could improve alignment of its operational functions, its competencies, its processes, its systems, for the purpose of more effective delivery on the human rights priorities under the integrated strategic plan. In other words, I wasn't the only one who had picked up that that integrated strategic plan wasn't all that helpful in planning our work. But this piece of work by Accenture um, clearly stood out to me as an opportunity to highlight the lack of integration both within and between Amnesty International and the International Secretariat in the issue of fundraising. Using Accenture's diagnostics, it was easy to demonstrate how fundraising and marketing communications were generated independently of campaigning and activism goals. We saw that with the stoning appeal, and which meant we often did two jobs rather than one. We created a fundraising strategy around one lot of content, campaigning and activism strategy around a completely different set of content. And we frequently approached the same audience with different asks, probably a very familiar conundrum to many people here. It was very easy to demonstrate, in fact, this disconnection between our research and advocacy work and our fundraising activities. Teams were operating entirely independently of each other. And we needed Accenture, I needed Accenture, to make this point to my leadership. So having demonstrated that point, Accenture being Accenture, they didn't want to let go of a good client, and they didn't want to stop at just reviewing Amnesty structures. They wanted to recommend some changes to those structures. Now, Amnesty being Amnesty, we don't want to make any changes until the case is absolutely proved. So I propose that Amnesty International's fundraising function be a guinea pig to demonstrate how some of Accenture's ideas about reorganisation could work. And there are a number of reasons why this suggestion got picked up. While the economic climate made a very good case for collaboration and coordination, there was such a high degree of concern that there was a bit of, well, we'll try anything. Uh, fundraising was already an area within Amnesty that had a professional discipline, if you like. Uh, we, had this, we shared same competencies, operational tools and methods, which we could all leverage for the, integrate and leverage for the benefit of Amnesty International as a whole. In short, we kind of spoke the same language within fundraising. I could make the argument for better investment decisions about where we would now put our limited resources to grow our fundraising. And we already had some collaborative things in place, such as our fundraising skill shares, again, something which I think many INGOs have also picked up on. I was also able to suggest some key uh, success indicators if the fundraising function was going to be used in this way. I was even able to dangle a little bit of actual income in front of them and say, well, if we collaborate, we might be actually able to leverage ourselves better with major donors and trusts and foundations to areas Amnesty International still significantly underexploits. And also talk about lowering our cost base. We could generate in economies of scale uh, from shared use of fundraising resources and fundraiser time. And also by standardizing some of our data and analysis procedures and even do things like increase our purchasing power. So in this way, I made the case for investing in a trial of a new way of working and 12 national directors of fundraising met at the end of 2008 to take this forward. So, our first meeting. We met around a very, very well-structured agenda, which was facilitated by a third party, Accenture, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. We jointly defined the problem. So rather than the Secretariat telling 12 national fundraising directors what we thought the problem was, 
although I did have the answer in the back of my mind, of course, we discussed it around the table together and came to a joint, a joint consensus and analysis. And it was also about joint vision development. Well, if we think that's the problem, what do we think it sh it, we should be doing in order to address it? Accenture were incredibly helpful in presenting a potential model of collaboration that my colleagues could react to. So at this point in the meeting, rather than having an open-ended conversation, something was put on the table for people to react to, to actually just keep the conversation going and, and help us to get some objectives. Again, using Accenture's models, clear descriptions of what would be in the model and um, how, how it would be designed and what the content might be. But then bringing back an opportunity to engage through brainstorming content for the, the various parts of the model. Now, it was so important that this was not seen as an international secretariat-led meeting. And Accenture's role as an independent third party was very, very important. So on the back of this very successful, well-structured meeting, a second me meeting was scheduled and also facilitated by Accenture. This really kept the momentum going and ensured that nothing was lost or deprioritized when people went back to their desks in their national offices and were faced again by uh, the, the concern and issues around the global economic crisis. So what did we take forward in these two meetings? This basically is a fundraising version of the Accenture model. They outlined key work areas which they um, turned into fundraising relevant areas that we should be working on together in this new collaborative way. We'd work on our strategy because grow our resources was not much of a strategy at this point. They talked to us about centres of expertise, a very specific way of collaborating and working together and coordinating. We talked about how we would better manage our people and our skill sets and how we would uh, do that within our current organisational frameworks. We talked about fundraising processes and how those differed and we could make them more consistent. We talked as well a lot about quick wins. How could we as a group very swiftly identify some successes that we could uh, demonstrate back to our senior colleagues? Were there improvements in the way that we used our data and our technology that we could be looking at? And what about some metrics and KPIs, which were clearly missing from our integrated strategic plan and clearly missing from, this space, from, the, from the global space altogether? The, this second meeting also was extremely important. Again, it couldn't be talking and discussion without clarity on outputs, and this framework gave us some things to aim for, clarity of outputs. If that meeting hadn't been structured in that way, we would easily have lost our sense of shared purpose and indeed the sense of urgency. And I'm sure many other NGOs present in this room know that our colleagues can talk, we can talk, and sometimes it's very hard to come to conclusions. So this, again, is very important to, to have this structure to the meeting. And we were able to define outputs to each of these in a way that made sense for us as fundraisers. So other key success factors in those very early days. Well, like a shopping mall has to have anchor stores. I don't know if you're familiar with that uh, concept. A new shopping mall is set up and they get one or two very large department stores in as the anchor stores, which will attract in other tenants. I had to have anchor directors of fundraising involved in this. So I had two key individuals that I had to identify, the director of, fun the director of fundraising at Amnesty UK and her opposite number at Amnesty USA. Between them, they raised around 60% of, 40% uh, of Amnesty International's income. And as the two leading English speaking sections, if they weren't at the table, things, other people wouldn't come essentially. It was also incredibly important to allocate action points and follow-ups. Again, Accenture's role in doing that, incredibly helpful. Difficult in that governance structure for me to take on that role. Very, very important to acknowledge concerns and identify mitigation strategies. All of the reasons when, for us not being collaborative and not coordinating in the global space hadn't gone away. So we needed to address those and put those out on the table and acknowledge them. 
we had 12 people around the table, a very, very helpful spread of individuals to actually take on pieces of work and develop a sense of ownership. Again, it couldn't be a secretariat job. Again, I couldn't take things away and do them on behalf of the movement. Overall, it was about keeping eyes on the prize and keeping the, the, uh, the goal of the gains that could be made in mind. And that's relatively easy for fundraisers to do. And again, that's the reason why this kind of method of working has worked for fundraisers at Amnesty, but has taken longer to take root for some of our other functional areas. In a relatively short space of time, so spurred on a little bit by the global economic crisis, um, the structures and objectives took root and a team developed. We very quickly renamed ourselves the Global Fundraising Management Team. And here we all are in our multicolored glory at one of our meetings in Berlin in front of a piece of the Berlin Wall. And my colleagues probably won't thank me for um, putting that up there. But that's too bad. Uh, within the space of three meetings, by June 2009, we'd added to and reprioritized the, the initial set of objectives. We'd even taken off our training wheels in the form of Accenture. We were doing this by ourselves. We developed a team culture with two key aspects, particularly when you think back to that diagram of Amnesty International's governance structure. A culture of mutual accountability. We took on roles and jobs within this team, which we reported back to the team on. Nobody reported to me or to the International Secretariat. They were reporting to their colleagues. We also had a culture of wearing a different hat when you're in the fundraising management team meeting. We also always said try and take off your national hat and put on your global hat when you come in the room. Try not to defend that national space and think about what your national space could gain from working in this international and collaborative space. We also developed a bit of a mantra, which we keep to this day. Again, about space, seizing the space. This was closely linked to the way in which the fundraising management team had got started, in fact, by seizing opportunities. Seizing the space at Amnesty International means trying to move into all those gaps which you could see in that governance structure diagram. Rather than waiting for that, for Amnesty's very cumbersome governance and leadership structures to tell us what to do, to give us a fundraising target, to tell us how much money to raise, we'd go and do that for them. We'd propose something. We'd propose a strategy. We would talk to the International Executive Committee. We would talk to our membership. We would say this is the way that we need to do these things rather than wait to get that leadership in direction. Because as John, I'm sure, can testify that leadership and direction was going to, for fundraising was going to take a very long time to come. So the fundraising management team has done a lot of things. Literally, without being asked, without there being any expectation, but with us clearly identifying and communicating the need to the rest of the organisation. We have delivered Amnesty International's first global fundraising strategy. And in the last six months, our second global fundraising strategy. So that's the document up here on the right-hand side. This strategy commits us to delivery of the movement's revenue goals, and we have specific and measurable objectives. We have key performance indicators relating to key elements of cost effectiveness and income sustainability. We've introduced an annual plan reporting process, so that's in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, by which Amnesty's revenue generating sections submit their fundraising plans for feedback and commentary to the fundraising management team. This has been an important development of the culture of mutual accountability and the idea that national fundraising teams are working to a global fundraising outcome. This is information we weren't otherwise receiving at the International Secretariat, and it's certainly not information that was otherwise being shared around the movement or receiving any feedback or development or direction. The fundraising management team then collates and adds up those annual plan reports and is able to report on trends, patterns, opportunities and threats to the leadership of the organisation. Getting information into a space rather than waiting for that information to be asked for from us. 
We've secured and driven Amnesty's participation in the INGO benchmarking project. And that's a, a screenshot of one of the outputs up there in the top left corner, made small enough so that I haven't revealed any market secret information up there. Uh, and most importantly, we use the findings of uh, this project to drive investment in fundraising. We're finally using external data to assess and evaluate our performance uh, in fundraising terms and not simply historical internal data. And this has had particular use when we've been trying to drive fundraising growth in our US section uh, in the wake of the crisis in 2008. We've been able to demonstrate to our colleagues that in fact fundraising in the US section has a very low ROI, not just compared to other Amnesty International uh, markets, but within the US market itself. And we're working with them to drive that up, principally through the use of monthly giving, uh, which is something they haven't uh, particularly been exploiting in the past. We've also pressed for and, and achieved a supported journey approach to Amnesty International celebrations of its 50th anniversary, the logo for which is there on the bottom right, making this actually an important data capture and lead generation opportunity for the movement. Merely two years previously, in the 60th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we invested an awful lot in communications and awareness raising, but weren't able to at uh, weren't able to plan to use that as an opportunity to reach out and engage with people. So we missed that as an opportunity. This time round, there were opportunities to engage around specific campaigns and supported journeys were developed, which hopefully would reach, meant the new audiences we had reached would stay with Amnesty International. Um, I was referring to our work with Amnesty USA. In addition to them, we've advocated for and secured uh, fundraising strategic support and investment for a further four target countries where we've got the greatest short-term growth, greatest short-term opportunity for growth. This is something that wouldn't have been possible if I was attempting this from the International Secretariat. My colleagues in each of those altogether five sections pretty much would have told me where to get off if I had done that. But I was able to represent a fundraising management team position backed up by external data through the benchmarking project use my colleagues on the fundraising management team to make some of the important points. And also, um, yes, sorry. So as one well as these uh, four areas, which we've made real improvements on, um, as a global, global group with standing and profile within a very diverse Amnesty International movement, we've also influenced the development of a global campaigns management team and the redesign of the International Secretariat's campaigns and communications functions to bring those together. So both of these will enable us to better deliver integrated campaign communications output, which will allow us to take a supported journey approach across a much wider range of Amnesty's activities. We've also secured the development of Amnesty's global identity as more than just the black and yellow logo, which has been developed over the last couple of years. Uh, to take on its role as a compelling and motivating brand for the 21st century that will help us to reach out and engage millions more supporters. So remember that structure diagram. These are things that I could not have achieved alone in my role as Director of International Fundraising. Right. Yep, that's me. Uh, so you can see we've undoubtedly had some successes, but boy, I still have some challenges. So what are some of those challenges that I'm still looking at trying to resolve? Well, a smaller group than the original group, the original 12 you saw beside the Berlin Wall, have ended up doing most of the work. And this has created real challenges around workload for those individuals and the amount that can actually be achieved and it's also reducing the scope of that culture of mutual accountability. Now, Accenture did warn me that this would happen. In large teams, it often ends up being fewer than half of people who actually take on work. But this has real implications. If the strengths are in mutual accountability, spreading workload, raising awareness and profile of fundraising, that's going to be tough if instead of one person, it's only four, when it could have been 12. So key question for me. How do I get the work distributed more evenly amongst that bunch of 12 people? 
Another challenge. Our governance structures aren't going anywhere. <laughs> And they still dictate that nationally based directors of fundraising are performance managed at the national level. They are judged by their national boards on how effectively they deliver national objectives. In such a structure, national objectives will always take priority over international objectives. So how do I, or how do we, acknowledge international work and get my national colleagues to make the time for it? This is still a challenge that needs to be resolved. We need to make the link between national responsibilities and the benefits of international collaboration more strongly. Too often, it's see working in the fundraising management team is seen as additional work, on top of, many of my colleagues say, their day jobs, or even for some, a perk. I get to go to meetings and stand outside the Berlin Wall. But many just can't take advantage of the work that we're doing at that level. So how do I better articulate the case for international collaboration, in fact, supporting national goals? And it's at this point that the economic crisis, originally having been a fantastic opportunity for me and Hillary Clinton, is starting to work against me. In a couple of our leading income generating sections, particularly in Europe, um, the budget cuts from national governments are really now starting to affect fundraising income in a way that they weren't in the first couple of years after that initial global crisis. So the focus is very much on shoring up and sustaining national income. There's even less space for some to be working at the international level. All of that said, though, we're a long way from where we were in 2008. So why has, this, why has it worked? Why have we been able to deliver those things, claim that space, raise the profile of fundraising at the Secretariat and in the movement, influence our campaigns and communications colleagues? Well, I've referred to it several times already. It's this, I think it's this idea of leading from behind. There was no way in which I was going to be able to get my colleagues to do this if I simply told them to do it. If I said it was, the, it was a great idea and the International Secretariat thought they needed to do this. So I've had to take a very interesting leadership role in this. And sometimes that's been very hard. I'm quite a mouthy Antipodean. I'm from New Zealand originally. And biting my tongue has been quite hard work at times. It's been about identifying allies and supporting them as well. Again, I've got my anchor individuals, and I've got my four or five people who end up doing a lot of the work. A key part of leading from behind is making sure they're well supported in their national roles and by their own leadership to do their jobs. A big part of it in any team is about being able to play to individual strengths in the team. It's quite clear that there are uh, some people on the fundraising management team who share, have a fantastic love for metrics and data, and the other 11 people are only too happy to get him to do it all. There are other people who are very much uh, engaged with the marketing issues around the global identity and making sure we bring Amnesty's brand values into that, so she's taking that forward. There are other people who are very interested in our skill sharing and how we retain and develop our staff around the world. So he's leading on that. Very much playing to people's strengths. And being very clear about concrete deliverables. Amnesty International is great sometimes at bringing together these international teams, but it's very hard to see what they're actually delivering and to be able to continue to make the case for investment in work at this level. So having concrete deliverables and reporting on those concrete deliverables. And we saw four or five of them earlier. As I mentioned earlier, joint problem definition and joint solution definition. This has to be something, again, that I lead from behind on. This has to take advantage of my colleagues' expertise and engagement as well. Uh, spotting and using opportunities. So just uh, my boss some, has sometimes said to me, do first and apologize later. And I think I did something recently where he might regret having told me to do it that way around. But um, this, in general, has been a, a great thing to do. Um, part of Amnesty International's challenge as, a, as head of fundraising is also its huge advantage. Nobody is putting those plans in front of you. Disadvantage. Nobody's putting those plans in front of you. Huge advantage. You can do it yourself. 
And finally, the very, very boring thing, but administration. Agendas, action points, follow-ups, organisation, this has all been part of the culture of the fundraising management team and hasn't necessarily been one of Amnesty International's strong points in the past. But really, we have developed a culture. It, it, it even has come down to things as simple as when we meet face-to-face -face for two days, currently we do that three times a year, but we're finding that hard to sustain, so maybe only twice a year. Uh, we are very clear with each other that we run from nine to six on both days, and that everyone is present to start at nine o'clock. A lot of international meetings, people will make plans to fly in on the morning of the meeting. And, if it, and we all know what short-haul flights around Europe can be like first thing in the morning. You know, you're up to one, two, three hours late. So we're very clear that the commitment is that you arrive the evening before, ready to be in the room for a nine o'clock start. Even things as simple as that have been incredibly important. So that is the story of how Amnesty International is learning, learning, it's, a, it's still ongoing to love its fundraisers. I, I've outlined some of the challenges. We're certainly not at the end of the road yet, but I really feel like we're on the right road and we have enough momentum to really keep us going. So that's my story, and I'm very, very happy to take any questions. <laughs>